Hello, welcome to the first episode of my podcast, Looking Behind the Label. My name is Ray Waddingham, and over the coming weeks, months, years, or however long that we hang out together, I'll be exploring the stories, the ideas, the experiences behind diagnostic labels. I mean, labels are okay for boxes, but in my experience, they can obscure more than they explain. So, putting them to the side just for a bit, I'm going out and about, having conversations with people that really inspire me, that can talk about experiences, research, their ideas, their work, and the things that they've survived in their life. This really isn't a show about mental illness. It's about what it means to be human in a world that can be really crazy-making. This time, though, I'm going to start a little bit closer to home. I want to tell you a bit about my journey and, crucially, how I found my voice after losing myself underneath the blanket of diagnostic labels that people applied to me when I was in the midst of distress in their efforts to help. And because music has been such a big part of my journey, I'll be adding in a few songs here and there. I mean, music to me, it's like breathing. It's my survival. But more than that, it's one of the ways that I've found to to really communicate some of the things that go on inside me. Sometimes words just really aren't enough. When I was a child, I felt like there was something badly wrong with me. I carried around with me a sense of my own evilness, badness. I was struggling with the effects of childhood abuse. I wasn't telling anyone around me what was happening to me. I didn't tell my parents, I didn't tell my sisters, I didn't tell school, I didn't tell anyone that could have actually helped me. Instead, I took it on myself to keep it secret. That might be hard for people to understand, but one of the tricks of an abuser is to make sure the child will not tell. And I was that child. So instead I internalised this sense of my own badness and believed it was mine, not theirs. And this wasn't the end of the universe. I mean, I had some really good things in my childhood. I had fun. I had ridiculous times, fights with my sisters. I had friends. I, I had a normal childhood in so many respects. But I also saw visions... And I also believed I had an alien inside me and I had self-harm as a strategy to cope with that. I had so many things that no one saw. And then when I went to university, something changed. I started to feel that I was being watched by cameras. You know that sense of prickliness on the back of your neck when you feel you're being watched? That's what I went through. I felt exposed and the only way I could make sense of it is that people were watching me through cameras and that this was part of a great conspiracy linked to the aliens and everything like that and if I'd have told you that back then you'd have probably thought I was crazy. I was certainly distressed and when I did speak out eventually when I spoke to a psychiatrist that's pretty much what they said. They said It's okay, Rachel, we know what's wrong with you. Just come into hospital, we'll get you on some medication and we'll get you back to university. You'll be okay. The problem was, I wasn't. Around this time, I found it really hard to speak to people, really hard to say what was on my mind. And I wrote so many songs about stuff that I couldn't articulate. I didn't even know what the meaning of the lyrics were. I just opened my mouth and stuff came out. I'm kind of like vomiting, but more musical. And this song I'm going to play you now, Spiders, it's one of those. It's a bit of a stream of consciousness, I guess. And looking back, I kind of get what I was going for with that. I get how it links to my story, but at the time it was just expression. Take me 
So there I was, an inpatient of a psychiatric unit, diagnosed with schizophrenia, then schizoaffective disorder, told really that I'd never recover. I mean, initially there were there was optimism, there was hope, but after the second, third, 25th hospitalisation, that hope was lost. I tried to kill myself so many times because I'd just given up on, on ever living a life that felt meaningful. I'd internalised the sense of being unwell. I'd internalised the sense of being broken. It just echoed with the childhood trauma that I'd gone through and my prior beliefs about myself. It just validated it and gave it a medical framing. And I got stuck. But things change. I'm forever grateful to the person that encouraged me to go to the Hearing Voices group, a peer support group for people that hear voices or have visions or other unusual sensory experiences. When I first heard about it, I was like, why would I want to go to talk about my voices? I just want them gone. Yet, when I finally went to the group, what I found was kind of stunning in its normality. I just found a group of people that happened to hear voices that had different backgrounds, different ideas, different opinions, but they were people, people that I could connect with, people that I became interested in, and people that I began to count as my friends. And in turn, they became interested in me, this quiet person in the group. They became curious about me, and they asked me questions that I had no answers to. They asked me, well, why do you think your voices say that? Why did they kick off that weekend? What was going on? And my answer that it was my schizophrenia or my psychosis just didn't seem sufficient. And that started me on this journey of looking deeper into my experiences. It wasn't an overnight thing. I'm a really stubborn person and it took me quite a while to to begin to, to really even want to look at this deeply. But the group opened up that possibility for me, that, that little spark of hope. And hearing people in the Hearing Voices movement talk about how they'd come through difficult times, that was mind-blowing. You know, the idea that not only could you sort of tolerate your experiences, but that you could have a life and a family or a career and still be having the voices, that, that was just weird. I don't really believe that that was possible for me. But somewhere inside there was a little flicker. And that hope that got extinguished in hospital began to grow again. It wasn't just about finding the group. At that time, I also found a supported housing project network for change. I found friends, relationships, and I began to open up to the world. You know, this closed person that was very protected... I began to connect again. I began to risk it, but I still believed that underneath it all, I was evil, broken, damaged. And so when I did have these moments of connection, they were fleeting, but they were precious. And this next song kind of speaks to that. It's called Don't Break the Spell.
Over time, things shifted for me. I started to do training with the Hearing Voices Group with Network for Change. I started to realise that I had something to offer to the world. I began facilitating groups. I began to write. I set up a website called Mad Not Bad years ago. And most of all, I began to rethink my experiences and this idea of being ill It didn't happen overnight. I think it was step by step. As I got exposed to new ideas, new people, I had to integrate that into my inner knowledge about who I was and and how I came to be where I am. And slowly, I started to question things. Am I really ill? What is illness? What is madness? How does my life experiences, the trauma that I've survived, how does that relate to what I see and hear? And it became obvious to me that I went through so much that I didn't speak about as a child that it it kind of got suppressed, it got held in a tight sort of bundle, but that I couldn't keep it down forever. So it came out in the form of the visions, the voices, the beliefs. They were metaphorical communications to myself and to others. But I lost the guidebook. I didn't know that that's what was happening. I didn't mean it to happen. And to me, those things were incredibly real and frightening. And they frightened other people too. So we all were running around dealing with the consequences of what was going on for me. But we missed the roots. We missed the thing that could have really helped me move forwards. And that's what happened. I managed to get a job as manager of the London Hearing Voices Project. I mean, how weird is that? Someone actually paying me to do things that I love. I developed work with children. I developed work in prisons. I began to be a trustee of different charities. I started to travel and train people and and go across the world sort of connecting. And I remember looking back at it and going, wow, sort of, you know, a decade ago, I'd given up on life and here I am on my way to Australia seeing wombats and things like that. It was kind of weird. Yeah, it was hard to believe in a way. I thought maybe I'm still crazy, but it it actually was happening. And all of that meant that actually I became less and less satisfied with living with medication that was giving me terrible side effects. And sedating me really sedating me so that it was hard to get up in the morning it was hard to motivate myself to go to work I had to literally drag myself there and my husband would pour coffee down me in the morning and and really try and push me out of the door pretty much um and because I was questioning the idea of illness and schizophrenia schizoaffective disorder I slowly started to experiment with my medication take the dose down bit by bit over the course of about three years until finally I stopped taking it altogether. And when I started to look around after the chaos, after the aftershock, and and bring together the rubble that was left, I found something really interesting. I found that I no longer believed that I was ill. And in amongst all of this, one day I found love. Sounds cheesy, doesn't it? But I found someone that I could risk connecting with and that was willing to connect with me. And this next song is one that I actually wrote on our wedding day, as weird as that sounds. It's called Feels Like Home. It's all me. I 
I'm safe in the strands he shows me how I am home again your touch brings me home again losing my way I fall to Get lost in yesterday, but older now. I am home again. Your touch feels like home again, and he peels back the scars from my sleeve to show. the filters through so hold me close I am home again your touch brings me home again and he peels back the scars on my sleeve to show So what am I trying to say with all of this? What's the take-home message, the punchline, or the point to this story? Well, part of it is there is no point. It's an evolving journey, and the story is going to change as often as I do. It will grow. It will move. But that's the point. I'm alive. I don't want to be defined by a narrow label applied to me by someone who knows very little of my journey or very little of me. I want to define myself, and I want that definition to change as I change. I want the right to evolve. It's okay to not be okay. I am not ill. I'm just a human being that's been through stuff. Some pretty terrible stuff and some cool stuff. But it's stuff. And that stuff has affected me. Nowadays, I live alongside my experiences, my voices, my visions, those unusual beliefs I have sometimes even the distressing ones. It's important to me that those who are connected with me, those who are in my life, can see both my strength as well as my vulnerability, that they connect with those things. Each of them doesn't cancel the other one out, because I'm all of that, as are you. I hope you found at least some of this interesting. In the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing others as I look behind the label and engage with the messiness of what it means to be human in this world. Hope you'll join me on this journey. Have a good week and speak to you soon.